My name's Michael. I'm uh, with the Long Now Foundation, and I, I want to welcome you to the interval. Um, we, uh, this is now, it's right about our, I think it's our 75th talk uh, that we've, we've done here uh, since 2014. So for those of you who it's your first time, I hope you'll uh, follow us and, and come back and see more. So uh, Margaret Levy is uh, the 10th director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Um, and we have had a really wonderful partnership over the last, uh, uh, going on three years now, uh, that's seen a number of the current fellows of the last several classes that have come and speak on this stage. Um, the, the center was founded in 1954 and has produced, I think, over 3,000, or has had more than 3,000 fellows uh, come through in that time with many names that you will know, from Daniel Kahneman to George Schultz to Ruth Bader Ginsburg to Norman Ornstein, Edward Tufte, Donald Norman, uh, and uh, uh, Stephen Lansing, Paul Romer, and Philip Tetlock, so several uh, Long Now speakers uh, in those numbers. Amongst them, they've, uh, they've, uh, they've uh, won 25 Nobel Prizes, they've won 26 National Medal of Science Awards, 23 Pulitzers, 51 MacArthur Fellowships, literally hundreds of Guggenheims. Um, and so it's, and, it, and it's an incredible resource, and frankly, for long now, to be able to, uh, to connect with some of the best academics we have around the world and, and bring some of them here uh, has been a great collaboration and, and a great honor. Um, working with Margaret has been great because essentially she's in, um, a curation process, which is, is a bit what I'm doing in, in producing this series. And so we, we meet in that way and we get to, to think about which amongst the amazing set of, of, of individuals that are in her uh, series are going to be a good fit for here. But, but it also means that curatorial mindset uh, is perfect for what she's going to do for us tonight, which is actually to look back at this uh, pursuit that's it, at once um, an instinct, I think, that we all have, and at another, something that over time we've developed into uh, quite an amazing enterprise, one of the great enterprises of, of civilizations uh, has, has, has produced. Um, and I want to say one more thing about uh, Margaret on that curatorial side. Um, she and her husband are two of the great collectors of Australian Aboriginal art. So uh, if any of you are going to be in New York before the end of the year or in Seattle, um, you uh, will be able to see s some selections from their uh, collection. The Met has eight select pieces uh, from, from her and her husband Robert Kaplan's collection that are currently on show and uh, at SAM, the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, there's a large collection that they've donated over the years. So um, clearly looking at humor and enterprise and excellence uh, all across the board, we're in great hands tonight. Please give a big round of applause for Margaret. Okay, what I want to talk about tonight is obviously the organized pursuit of knowledge. And I'm going to start backwards and then go forwards. And we're going to make some steps forwards and some steps back as we think about that process. And I'm going to emphasize two themes throughout. The first is really that there are two big issues that, at least for me, pervade all efforts at organized knowledge. The first one is normative, in a sense. It's how do we produce better societies? How do we design them? How do we govern them? What kinds of values do they have? What kinds of virtues do they represent? How do we build a political economy that's also a moral economy that really speaks to those issues? Now, to do that, we really have to understand our world. We have to build from what's realistic. And that's the second theme. And I'm going to start by focusing on the second theme about how we see and how we understand and then build to the other one, come back to the other one. So I'm going to use two metaphors in thinking about this problem. Underlying that is we need lots of tools to see, lots of tools to understand, to see both what can be seen and to see what we cannot see, but is necessarily a building block of what we're going to do. So the first 
metaphor, if you will, is the one that Otto did for us, which is the telescope and the microscope. And what they represent, quite obviously and evidently, is an ability to look wide and to see a big picture, and an ability to look deep and to look really inside, and often to, in both cases, to reveal things we could not see with the naked eye. But they do two different things, and we need both. Right, to really understand the world, we need to be able to do both. The other um, metaphor I'm going to use, there it is, is the blind men of ancient India. Often, I mean, the Jews thought they were the men of Helm, but they're actually old Indians, ancient Indians from that civilization. And you know this story. They can't identify the elephant in the room, right? They're all looking at different pieces of the elephant. One sees, feels the tail, one feels the skin, one feels the hoof. They don't have a model. They don't know how to conceptualize what they're seeing. They don't know how to com work together, even, to build a picture of what that is. So that's the other metaphor, to have an organized pursuit of knowledge that actually produces knowledge that matters, that we care about. You need to be able to put together the pieces of what you're seeing. And again, that requires some collaboration, some team effort, multiple disciplines, multiple ways of thinking about things. So how do we organize knowledge to serve these joint ends of design and of seeing? Okay, and that's what I'm really going to talk about. So let me give you a little bit of history first. You've learned <laughs> that we collect, my husband and I collect Australian Aboriginal art. And so I couldn't help but refer to that and refer to that culture in this talk. Because when we think about systematic knowledge and the way in which it's passed to uh, other generations from the elders to the younger, it's not just a question of building universities. We've had ways of passing on systematic knowledge forever. So these rituals that the Australian, these are fairly modern Australian Aborigines, but what they're doing is something that their culture has been doing for 50,000 years as a way to reveal what can't always be seen. They have a problem. They have to get through the desert. They have to find the water. They're in small bands of hunters and gatherers. And they have to convey what the land is like. So wherever you are, you can find the water. You can find your way out. You can find back to the corroboree and the group. And so they used paint. They used songs. They used getting together in larger groups in their hunting and gathering bands to pass on the knowledge. This is just a picture of the dancing. Knowledge gets codified maybe 6,000 years ago with the Jews. Um, and we get the Talmud, which is also a, a lot of arguing and a lot of collaboration and a lot of disagreement, but creating a law, creating a written law. But we become modern, if you will, in our organized pursuit of knowledge. And I'm just going to refer to the Western tradition here largely. There are other traditions. There's, there's a Chinese tradition, an Indian tradition. There are many other traditions in the world. But I'm going to refer to the Western tradition and how it organized the, the pursuit of knowledge. So we really start with the Greeks. Maybe. They're the Greeks. <laughs> so that's Plato and Aristotle from a famous Renaissance painting, which wasn't done at the time they were alive, in case you <laughs> mix up your history there. So the symposia is a really important institution that gets created with the ancient Greeks. And again, it's what's really different about this from what the Australian Aborigines were doing is that it's a very active, critical process. It's about asking questions. It's not just about passing on knowledge or passing on the law, even though there was questioning always about that. But it's really about creating an environment in which critical thinking is absolutely crucial, in which the whole basis of the Socratic method is challenges and questions. So people learn from each other. They learn from their mistakes, and they learn from the progress that they each make. They become members of a group, of a colloquia, that is dedicated to discovery, to pushing the boundaries of what they understand and what they know. But critical thinking is really the key to this process, and that's what we're going to follow that train. 
the curious mind, the scientific mind, begins to emerge. But in these early stages, you don't see all the specializations that we now see. Think about Aristotle or later da Vinci. These are people who pull together all of the sciences, natural sciences, social sciences, philosophical sciences, economic sciences. They're part of the same process. They're part of one big whole. They look at human behavior, and they look at the ways in which humans interact, and they put it in the natural world and in the larger world. And they're looking both inward and outward, deep and wide trying to see the moving parts, but also trying to understand the whole. They're trying to do that to understand. Yes, that's a critical part of what they're up to. But they also are working very hard to figure out how to design a better world, how to use that knowledge as the building blocks of really thinking about how to, what governance should look like, what cooperation engenders, and how it's created. Okay, so now we move again, and we move to the universities. This is a university in Fez, created in the ninth century. I won't even try to pronounce its name. Korean, I think. Um, it's arguably the first university in the world, but the one that gets the distinction in most history books is this one, Bologna, which was created in 1088. So we're in the 11th century, the 10th and 11th century. We see the burgeoning of universities. But they're, in a sense, a step backward, though they're going to move us many steps forward, ultimately. They're religious institutions. They don't require questioning. They require just passing on the knowledge, the writ, what is accepted. And they're extremely exclusive. It's not that universities open up all that fast, but these are really a very small group of people who are allowed to possess this kind of knowledge, to see the books that are written down, to have access to information. So universities begin as very, very exclusive places, as opposed to places that are open to really bringing up all the questions and allowing everybody in to ask those questions. The next real move is a big bang for the organized pursuit of knowledge where we begin to have some really serious scientific advance. It's not that this is the first scientific advance. Obviously, there's Galileo. There are lots of people who precede this. But in 18, uh, 1657, or there in the 1650s, we get the publication of William Harvey's De Moto Cordis on the motion of heart and blood. He has looked inside the body. He has figured out a way in which blood circulates. This is a huge advance. This is something you couldn't see. You could only see it, I mean, once you took a dead body and took it apart, you, might, you couldn't see the blood. <laughs> it was gone. So he had to infer it. He had to use science. He had to use tools that were available. And it's the beginning of a major explosion, right? This, this leads to the Enlightenment. Um, and we begin, which is in the late 17th century into the mid 19th century. And we get a huge amount of new kinds of ways of thinking, of learning. We get the, the science of Newton and many others. We get the social philosophy of Locke, Hume, Rousseau, and many others. We get the economics and social sciences, again Hume, one of the great figures in all of this history, and of Adam Smith and Jeremy Bentham and many others. Um, the next step forward is really with liberal arts and graduate education, which are 19th century creations, largely. There's greater inclusion. There's breadth, but also specialization. This is the era of the classic education where every young man <laughs> of a certain class had to learn Greek and Latin, but also natural science and philosophy. But they were still very exclusive institutions in terms of gender, race, class, right? So this is Rosa Luxemburg, one of my great heroines. How many of you have ever heard of Rosa Luxemburg? My students have heard of her, <laughs> one of, at least one of whom is here. <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg was a very important um, political economist at the turn of the the early part of the 20th century, the last part of the 19th. Her death 
was uh, by drowning. She was murdered uh, by the Germans at the end of World War I because of her social beliefs. She was a, Demo a social democrat. She was a socialist. She was a communist and fought with Len Lenin, had a different view of organizing. She was a very ambitious woman who wanted to go to graduate school. And she found in this wonderful graphic novel called Red Rosa, this is the image from that, she found that there was a graduate school that accepted women, the University of Zurich. And so she went to the University of Zurich and graduated from there with a PhD in 1887, just to give you a sense of that it wasn't that long ago, right? How hard it was for women to get an education. Another heroine of mine is Gertrude Stein, who went to Radcliffe, studied with William James, so she learned psychology and philosophy, then went to Hopkins Medical School because it was one of the only places a woman could go on and get a degree. She was bored there and left to go to Paris to become the Gertrude Stein we know, mm -hmm. using some of the things she'd learned from William James in the process of writing her poetry. My own experience in getting an education involved a place called Western High School in Baltimore. It was the first public high school that women could attend. I was not in the first class. That was in 1844. Walt Whitman gave the convocation speech. But it, was, it still exists, and it's got this very long history. It was created as a place where women, women could go. There was an Eastern and a Western, because women couldn't travel very far from where they lived. And it really prepared women to be teachers, not university teachers, teachers of young children. And it grew from that, so it became one of the famous places for college preparatory work, a public high school, right? Others followed suit. I then chose to go to Bryn Mawr College, which had a similar history, but for universities. Um, founded in 1855, again, I was not in the first class, though I am getting close to feeling like I was. Um, and it was a place that was the first college for women that did two things. One, it followed the Harvard model in terms of standards. So it was the highest standard of any place that women could go. And the second thing it did was provide the first graduate program at a women's college. So it was one of the first and only places women could get a college, a grad, both a college education of a very high quality and a graduate education. So that's what formed me. So you can see why I care about these <laughs> issues of exclusion. This is James Meredith and Ole Miss, just to remind you about how recently our universities were exclusive. This is not that long ago. This is the 1960s. Now, there were exceptions. Harvard was founded as an Indian college, Native American college. Um, there were the historically black colleges that got formed. But nonetheless, until very, very recently, colleges and universities in the United States, as well as elsewhere, were extremely exclusive. They've opened up, they really opened up in the post-World War II era more than any other time. They also had another problem. There was a tendency towards over-specialization and scholasticism that began to develop. So how many of you read Middlemarch? My favorite character in Middlemarch, in some way, so he's awful, is this desiccated scholar named Kosobin, who marries the beautiful woman. She thinks he, he's the epitome of everything wonderful until she realizes he's not. He cannot finish his books. His books are boring. By the time he does them, nobody cares. They're outdated. That's scholasticism writ large. This is actually a picture of John Locke, who people, <laughs> who people think looked was what Kosobin was based on. OK, to go back. OK, so people kept searching. I mean, here were these exclusive universities, and they were, in many ways, scholastic from the popular viewpoint. They weren't legible. They weren't accessible. So people kept searching for better ways to learn and better ways to research. And there were a number of ephemeral solutions that developed, but they're interesting models for how to think about what we can do, and particularly as we move forward. One was the Chautauqua of the 19th century, which was basically a moving lecture, a sort of summer camp of information and lecturing. Um, others, which have developed more recently in the 21st century, are perhaps the modern-day 
equivalents, maybe, MOOCs. Are they ephemeral? Are they here to stay? I don't know, but they certainly have a Chautauqua kind of feeling of a way to reach out to a lot of people, to be entertaining, to gather you together, but you're doing it as an individual watching something that a lot of other people are watching, so it doesn't have quite the same feeling. Something that does is the maker's movement. There's things going on where people get together in fairs and they share information. That may be, I don't know if it's ephemeral, but it's another way to try to find learning and um, to do research that's outside of the confines of the university. The 20th century, we get other kinds of things that have developed. One which un unfortunately turned out to be ephemeral, we'd hoped it would last longer, were the co corporate funded research centers such as Bell Labs and Xerox Park, which when they were at their heyday, they were outside the university, though they drew on people who'd been trained in the universities. But in their heyday, they were really the places where incredible innovation in science, particularly not so much in social science, occurred. We also see in the 20th century the development of institutes for advanced study. Of course, I had to get that in. Um, the first one is the Institute for Advanced Study that's at Princeton. Sorry, I need some water to talk about Princeton. Um, <laughs> So Princeton was started in the 1930s, and its model was really one of permanent faculty who were super famous, and the advanced study really referred to the fact, which it still refers to for all of us who have such places, that they were going to go beyond the boundaries of what was already known and what had already been studied. They were going to advance study well beyond that, advance research. So famous names affiliated with the Institute for Advanced Study were largely very important emigres from what was happening in Europe at that time. So Einstein, von Neumann, et cetera. Okay. So they started the Institute for Advanced Study. The second Institute for Advanced Study in the world was the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, which came in in the 1950s. I'm looking at Bob, because if I say something wrong, he'll get me. He'll slap me down. He'll tell me what's right. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so, um, so we were the second, and, but we had a very different model. We came out of the Ford Foundation, a Ford Foundation committee that was looking at how to use the new tools and methods that had been developing in social science, how to look deep and how to look wide. Um, to, and in the heyday of the optimism of the post-World War II era, to create something that would really enable social scientists to contribute their knowledge to human welfare, back to our, one of our original themes. And so the Center for Advanced Study was what was created, and it's a beautiful place on a hill overlooking Stanford, and you should all come visit if you haven't. It really is a gorgeous mid-century institution. It, but the idea there was not to have permanent faculty. I am still the, on, I'm the only permanent faculty at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Science. It was to bring together really brilliant minds to be inter, uh, interdisciplinary from many social sciences, some sciences, some humanities, to be in the same place, to have lunch together, to walk together, at one point to play volleyball together. They don't do that anymore, Bob, so much. They play ping pong, though. Um, and to really start thinking new ways of approaching really critical issues. And that's still our mission this day, and there are several fellows and former fellows in the audience, and I encourage you all to meet up with them. They are brilliant minds. Okay, so the next question I want to ask is has, make sure I'm still in time, has the organized pursuit of knowledge really delivered? Do we see better? Do we understand more? Have we built better designs? At best, um, the pursuit of knowledge pr encourages critical thinking, often sometimes leading to tolerance of new ideas, to innovation, to challenges to the status quo, though sometimes those who challenge the status quo aren't happy personally with the consequences, think Socrates having to drink the hemlock, but we've continued to chase people out of universities who think too critically. At its best, it does what Abraham Flexner, the first director of the Institute for Advanced Study, called the usefulness of useless knowledge. 
You let people do their thing. You don't know what it's going to come to. And lo and behold, some of that turns into things that change our world, that change all kinds of tools we have, change the way we think. You know about Einstein, von Neumann, von Neumann, I'd add Gödel's. But what about some of Casbus's past fellows? Michael mentioned a few of them. Tversky and Kahneman, Arrow, Rawls, Philip Tetlock, who recently spoke in a SALT lecture. What we try to do in, these kind, in the best of places of organized pursuit of knowledge, whether it be our center or a university, is to create an environment in which they can flourish by trying things and flourish by learning new ways of seeing as well as new problems. I was going to talk about some of my own research topics, some of the arcane stuff that you can see in the book that John Alquist and I wrote. But I think for, for lack of time, I will just move on. I'm glad to answer questions or talk to you over drinks, which I'm looking forward to after I finish giving this talk. But the organized pursuit of knowledge is sometimes its own worst enemy. It can be hierarchical and patriarchal. Um, it can have problematic research incentives, slow, not so risky so that you get tenure. And it also has produced, as we've seen recently, some real frauds who bring down the good name of social science and science generally. So what does the future look like? That's the present. And we need to go beyond that and really deliver more. So given the baseline shifts beginning in World War II, so the mid-century, we've seen a number of things happen, which we have to understand in order to figure out about the future. One is there have been big changes in popular and government demands about what, who education should deliver to and what it should deliver. We've seen the expectations of a mass education We've seen changes in funding that tends to reward things that will deliver more immediately, not so much the usefulness of useless knowledge, but really pragmatic. Can we get to the moon? Can we build a better light bulb? Can we do this or that? Can social science provide a piece of data that will answer some specific question? Foundations have fallen into that trap. Um, certainly government has. And we're seeing a lot more, even more emphasis than we saw in the 50s on meeting the needs of private sectors, particularly, I think, the technology sector. So we're confronted with a number of challenges that we need to overcome. Let me start with the challenges and then head to the scenarios of what might happen. We have corporations who refuse to share data appropriately. And even more importantly, we have disbelief of scientific discoveries. In part because of hype, this is based on um, the Gartner hype curve. It's, it's done by a Nobel Prize winner named Bedzik, who actually created one of the great, several of the great microscopes, um, and has a fabulous talk about that. And so we're seeing this incredible amount of hype all the time about particular discoveries or expectations of discoveries or other things that doesn't help us um, because it leads to unjustified claims, whether it be a study that Carrie and I were just talking about, about living wages in Seattle le leading to restaurants having worse health conditions, which is not true, but was hyped and got a lot of attention, um, and cited several times on NPR as an authoritative study, but that kind of hype doesn't help us. So we see all kinds of promises not kept, expectations not met. Um, I think about education policies, all the things that we've been told will solve our education problems that have failed to do so. So that leads to disbelief in what social science can actually produce, and that's a challenge for us. But there's, the big challenge is how do we get all of us and the larger public to really understand that science is never going to be absolute. Our findings are never going to be the end result. I was mentioning um, before this started, think about Pluto. We were sure it didn't exist. And then we saw it, and it was a planet. And then we saw it better, and it wasn't a planet. But that's the nature of science. You have theories. You refute them. You try again. You refute them again. 
it's going to be that kind of process, and that requires a different kind of understanding from the public, as well as from our students, as well as from our practitioners about what science is at, all about. So where are we heading? There's a scenario I really don't like, but it could be the one we're in or heading for. An increasing bifurcation between elite privates and underfunded publics all over the world. Class stratification increased again. Real opportunities decreased. A move towards STEM vocational education and away from the value of liberal arts widely and correctly understood, of critical thinking, of seeing both deep and wide. The one I want to achieve, the scenario I'd like to see, see us move toward, and which I hope in some ways CASBIS can contribute to, has the end goals of even greater advances based on real scientific thinking and not just intuitive common sense and unfounded beliefs, a lot of what we see occurring. Whether it be about the benefits of coffee, <laughs> how many times have we read coffee's good for us, coffee's not good for us, coffee's good for us, it's good for women, it's not good for women, um, or other sources, or, this, or myths we hear about the sources of racism or populisms or war. We've really got to get those things down. The requirements, I think, are real interdisciplinarity, not just bringing people together to lunch, um, as we did in the early days of the Center for Advanced Study, and thinking the multiple disciplines would actually just somehow attract each other. Sometimes they did in various ways. But what we really want is to think about problems in an interdisciplinary way. Think about the big problems that are confronting us and bring together people who come from multiple perspectives, multiple disciplines, multiple methods, some of whom are in academia and bring that knowledge to bear, some of whom are journalists or who are in industry or in government who bring that knowledge to bear and their sets of questions to bear and have a real conversation about that and make real advances that serve both. That means we, we would develop real collaborations, um, perhaps achieving what John Seeley Brown and Ann Pendleton Julian, sitting here in the front row, talk about as networks of imagination. A lovely term. In which we can really advance solutions on wicked problems and the capacity to see both deep and wide, to see back to the microscope and the telescope, if you will, and understand what we are seeing, how it is distorted, how it can be clarified if we have the right tools. The attention can't be only to technology. Perhaps more importantly, and this is, I really want to emphasize this, and this is where something like CASBIS really comes in, into how humans think, how humans interact, how humans build and destroy societies. We need to bring the human back into the science and the technology, not just the effect on the humans, but how humans actually interact with all of that and make things different. What CASBIS can do, and several of my co-conspirators are in this room, is to really try to work towards the development of a new moral economy, and that leads to a whole bunch of different projects that we currently have on the future of work and workers, not just work, but the people who are doing the work and what's gonna happen to them, to the social life of climate change, um, not just the natural life, but how people are affected and how they can affect through both mitigation and adaptation. Policies informed by evidence where what we know about humans and how they will react to policies comes into the story issues of technology, society, and the human, et cetera. So let me conclude. We need, this is a wonderful painting that um, Dennis Evans did, who's an artist in Seattle, did for my class at CASBIS. He came and interviewed, all, this was 93, 94. He came and interviewed all of us, and he tried to represent our class in this painting. And it's, we use it a lot um, to sort of represent what CASBIS is all about, the book, the tree of learning, the variety of disciplines, the variety of issues that we study. We need good social science. We need it. New, good science about the human. 
and human interactions, to inform public policy, to generate realistic assessments of what's wrong and right with the world. I attended a conference this morning and I was struck by how all these incredibly smart people were there, but how they tended to, and they were saying really interesting things, and then they would say something about social science or a social science issue, and they would draw on the worst pop social science. They really didn't have a good grasp of it. We've got to change that. We've got to make sure all of us really understand what we know and what we don't know, um, and how to use it. Um, I, everyone wants to claim now that they understand Tversky and Kahneman. For example, you've all read Michael Lewis's The Undoing Project. You got it down, right? Yeah. Well, it's a little more than that. So we need to be attentive to how to do good social science, and we need to be attentive to how to convey what we've learned. So we need to see wide and deep, up close and far away, as I keep emphasizing, and integrating those ways of seeing into the elephant in the room back to the ancient men of India. In a continual and very difficult process, because it means constant challenge, constant rethinking what we're seeing, re-seeing what we think we saw. That makes us susceptible to hype and to fads. Social science is the we here. It makes us susceptible to accusations of scholasticism, scholasticism and really useless knowledge. It can breed confusion, even disbelief among the public about the benefits of good science. But it's still worth doing and we've got to learn how to do it better and right and to convey it better. But I think the really hard task still lies ahead. And that's taking what we've learned and reintegrating it as Aristotle did with the state of knowledge of his time. We've got to bring all the pieces back together into one whole and to make all those studies, all that in a sense was useless knowledge, come together to form how we design our societies and to chart our path into the unknown future. Thank you. Thank I know you, there's at least one question in the room because yeah. he asked it before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we, we definitely have some time for questions. Uh, we also have our live stream. I want to thank folks that are listening on the live stream. And uh, I've got a, a, an, an iPad that's going to tell me your questions. So go ahead and ask in the chat. And uh, hopefully we can get some of your questions in. Um, before, please think of your questions. I've got a couple uh, things I want to start. I actually want to talk for a second more about CASBIS. So, um, <laughs> okay. And I know you want to argue with that. but. Um, so I've, I've had a chance to, to see a bit about CASBIS and understand a little bit more the mechanics that I don't think in passing most people would. And it fascinates me because in some ways there are some direct parallels with what, what we're doing and specifically yep. what we're doing in this place uh, in having a social atmosphere around ideas. Um, so uh, yeah, I think probably most people in this room have some exposure to academia, whether you're in it or have a relative or something that's in it. And, or um, went through it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, or running away from it. Right. And, <laughs> uh, but but there's, um, there's a tendency toward, or a, or a danger of siloing, and mm -hmm. there's, there's a, just like any uh, collegial group, that there is an insularness that tends to happen. What, what fascinates me is that the structure of CASBIS, the way it's set up, inherently kind of breaks against uh, that because these scholars are taking this fellowship year to, uh, to, to come to a different institution where even if there's someone who's a fellow economist or sociologist there, they probably come from a different thing. They're meeting each other with different experiences and it kind of shakes up their experience. Um, can you say a little bit, because I'm, I'm curious about, there's also, again, the interesting here, the direct social interaction of the individuals is kind of um, structurally uh, uh, built into it. And also um, the, the orations, the, the, the talking about their work is also something you require from the fellows. Can, can you just say a word about kind of how the, how the fellowship year works out for, for people? Sure. Though their fellows here can say something yeah. about that too. Yeah, we'll, get the real story. we'll get the real story later. So we've just started our fellowship class. It just began two weeks ago. Um, and what we always start with is making it clear to people who arrive that whatever they think they're going to do that year, let it go. Think about what, be affected by 
one, the time that you finally have to really think in a different way, and by these incredible individuals who are all around you, and that if you're lucky, you will think really differently at the end of the year. I can't predict how people will think or how they will change, and some it'll be a small amount that matters a lot, and some will be a lot. I mean, they'll just totally transform the kind of work they're doing. But we try to create an environment, and that's been true for a very long time, probably from the pretty close to the beginning, an environment where people have that right and are encouraged to really be able to, to be the next person they want to be as a thinker. We encourage that further by there's only, there are only two requirements at CASBIS for the fellows. In Bob's time, it was to play volleyball at lunch, but that's no, after lunch, but that's no longer the case. Ours is having lunch together three or four times a week, and we have a very constrained time for lunch, 12 to 12.30. There's no food for you after 12.30. Barbie will not let you take food after 12.30. We don't want people sitting in their offices and saying, well, I was trying to finish this paragraph and it's one o'clock and this is when I feel like eating. Because we want people to interact with each other. There's a sub rule in there, so I'll slip in a third rule here before I get to the second one. So this is 1A, which is that even though there are clusters of people also at CASBIS now who are working together or working on common projects, they're not allowed to have their work meetings at lunch. Right? They're supposed to be interacting with the other fellows. The second rule is they have to attend, and they have to be at lunch three or four times a week. The second rule that we have is that they have to attend each other's seminars. Every fellow gives a seminar um, talking about his or her research. And that's an absolute requirement. Um, occasionally one is missed by someone but that's how people play, try out their ideas. We learn about each other. We interact with each other and try to form something bigger than the whole. Now, something has changed since its first days. I was recruited, actually, to reimagine CASBIS for the 21st century. It was a, a, a mid-19th century institution. The way I like to say it is, if you look at the first class of fellows, you can point out the one woman if you really look hard. But it's basically a group of white men of a certain age who wrote great books and did it individually with research assistants, sometimes with their wife, <laughs> who didn't often get credit. So if you look at the class now, it's incredibly diverse. It's diverse in age. It's diverse in not just disciplines. That's always been true. It's international. It's gender diverse. It's racially diverse. Um, it's diverse in just lots of different kinds of ways. So that's been one big change. But what I really changed was, or have been attempting to change, is to create an environment where we can have some ongoing, if you will, symposia, some ongoing discussions around some important themes. I named some of them in my talk. And to really institutionalize that. So there might be a fellow or two. Sarah is part of a group, Sarah Ogilvie, who's a linguist. And she's here for the year. She won't be a fellow next year. She wasn't a fellow next year, last year. But the group that she's part of has a lifespan of three to five years, let's say, and will be based at CASBIS, have meetings there, pull in fellows who she meets this year. It's That's, like an institution within the institution, in a way. Right. Yeah. But it has to be integrated with the rest. It has to be constantly playing off others who are there, learning from other people who are there, to create that kind of environment, both as a model and a possibility a proof of concept, if you will. Um, and we'll take a question from the audience in a second. Um, we've got the, the mic right there, so just uh, let her know. And so just uh, for, for folks that may not off the top of their heads, I guess we kind of have the disciplines that are typically there uh, in, this, in this work of art, but what, what, are, the, what are the disciplines that uh, it's usually well, the, the core sciences? the core social sciences are, I start with political sciences because I'm a political scientist. <laughs> Political science, sociology, psychology, um, anthropology, economics, and history. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> I wasn't going to leave out economics. <laughs> um, economics is an important one. And history. But we've, we've often had people from literature, people from... Um, philosophers. Philosophers yeah. are regularly there. Yeah. We often have philosophers. Um, we've had groups of biologists. We've had some physicists. 
It really varies from year to year. All right, we've got a question. Architects. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about snow for a moment. You snow. mentioned biologists and physicists. Are there two cultures? How do you bridge them? Are there 10,000 cultures? And are you guys doing anything about this fake news and attention uh, subversion economy? So those are two two-part question. Two cultures and 10,000 cultures. Right. So, um, of course there are two cultures. Uh, they still, I mean, specialization is still with us and on all the linguistic divides as well as conceptual divides between the two. I'm doing a lot of work right now with engineers who we also now have at the center and, and some work as well with some people who are studying the ocean, so biologists and others. And the first thing we've got to do in those cases, and I think this is true of the fellows and all of the groups we've created, is find a common language. Make sure that the concepts that we're talking about make sense to each other. And sometimes it turns out, I was just having a conversation with a computer scientist that I'm working with. I said something about beliefs, and he described it in another, a functional something or another. And then we had to figure out whether what we were saying was exactly the same thing. It turns out it wasn't, but the language was a divide that was giving us a false sense of understanding as opposed to a true sense of misunderstanding that could be corrected. So the first thing we have to do in any of these interdisciplinary groups is overcome that and give people space to learn enough from each other and to trust each other enough. And part of it is we're never going to all become specialists in each other's area. We don't want to be. That's not advantageous in this world. I mean, there are things that people really know deeply that we want them to know deeply, and they bring that into the conversation. We have to find a way to, to, to take all of those ingredients and meld them into something better without destroying the kinds of knowledge that people gained and need to gain in order to really make that happen. So that's the first question. It's, not, it's a process, and it's a hard one, and we have to do it. We just have to do it. Um, the second question about false news and the various ways in which uh, information is misunderstood, um, yes, we've struggled with that problem at CASPIS. I don't think we're necessarily, I mean, one of the things we're constantly doing there, and there's certainly fellows who are thinking about those issues and former fellows who are, but one of the things we always do with our projects is to try to find our niche, is to find something that we can do that others either aren't doing, aren't doing well, or where we would be complementing something else that's going on. And so the false news one, for example, we have thought a lot about um, and had some projects, had some workshops around that, but decided there are other groups that are really doing that, and we can send people to those groups from our network and if the issue transforms in a way that makes sense for us to be thinking about it, we'll do that. But that doesn't mean that, our, that the social scientists who are at CASBIS and have been at CASBIS and will be at CASBIS, this acronym, CASBIS is the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, a really unfortunate um, acronym, but <laughs> <laughs> so be it. Um, you know, what we, a lot of them are thinking about the ways in which beliefs are formed, the ways in which uh, people generate ideologies or echo chambers or other ways that blind them from making discernments about the sources of information and whether it's credible information or not. So I see our fellows as constantly contributing to trying to solve or advance, hardly ever get a full solution, but advance on the kinds of questions that are really disturbing people today. Hope that was. Uh, hi. Um, thanks so much. Um, oh, thanks right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thanks so much for your talk. It was really awesome. I was wondering because the talk title was um, about knowledge, right? Um, and then you started off with saying that a normative goal is making a, creating a better society, right? So I was wondering um, if knowledge, not knowledge probably usually serves creating a better society. But what if the two were ever in conflict? Like, what's the ultimate goal here? Is it really the pursuit of knowledge, or is it creating a better world? If the two were ever in conflict, so if you take a hypothetical case, a thought experiment in philosophy, uh, where you knew that acquiring a certain piece of knowledge would be bad for um, the society that you'd create with it afterwards, which one would you ditch? Because uh, from my background, right, um, I always thought that, like, 
not even the pursuit of knowledge, but also open sharing of knowledge uh, is really important and is usually good. It's a net benefit. But now uh, I sometimes find that you might not want to make all the knowledge openly um, available um, and that sometimes knowledge could hurt if it's distributed at a wrong time. So I'm really grappling with that fact of knowledge uh, as a pursuit in itself and the value of it versus its value for creating a better society and what to choose. <laughs> That's a great question. And um, I want to evade it, is my <laughs> deep instinct, <laughs> and believe that the two are totally compatible, but I think you're right that there can often be a conflict between the two. But I don't think it's actually, my instinct is it's not actually a deep conflict if the design of the rules of, the, of our society are good. Um, and actually functioning for us. So you're really emphasizing the accessibility of knowledge more than the pursuit of knowledge. So I think the pursuit of knowledge is almost always good. I mean, and the scientific process. When you make things available, it may be a different kind of decision um, because you don't want to fall into the hype. You don't want to promise something you can't deliver on. So there's a very complicated process about, I mean, this is a society that likes one we live in right this second, likes instantaneous information. So the belief that you have to share something the minute you've discovered it, I think is problematic. We need to keep testing it, we need to refine it, we need to understand the context under which it works and doesn't work, and then it's shareable. So I don't think ultimately the two are in conflict, but I don't think it's always easy to resolve that tension. Um, and as we're getting our next question, um, you talked about really good social science at, uh, at, at as kind of where you concluded. Can you say another word about that? Because I think we all know what the scientific method is in, in, in a general sense, but for, um, for social sciences and for 21st century social sciences with new data tools and new technologies that are coming out there, can you say a word about what, what defines or, or denotes uh, um, w what some of the best practices are or, 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 or what yeah, how, how do you, if you're evaluating or critiquing something that you're looking at that this study is... Something I never have to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My husband believes that all we academics do all day long and all week long is critique other people's work and write reviews of it and evaluations. And there's something to be said for that. So what criteria do we use? I mean, that's, that's the deep question. And how do we advance the best practices? So... <laughs> Social science is not, you know, I'm using it as a big tent, but there are lots of different pieces in that tent, just as, so it's, it's multiple cultures, even within social scientists. The way economists think and the kind of model that they generally use is different than the way an anthropologist thinks and the kinds of multiple models that different kinds of anthropologists use. A Jamie Jones, who does more physical anthropology, thinks really differently than a social anthropologist, right? So you've got really different methods going on even within the social sciences. But all of them ultimately have to meet certain standards. So what I think we've generally agreed on are the best scientific practices. It's not just social science, it's generally science of which social science is part, which is refutation, the capacity to be able to refute something that sometimes it's created by data and it's data driven, but sometimes it's a, a couple, it's observational, sometimes it's uh, based on field work, um, but you have to be able to set it up in a way that somebody could challenge it, that somebody could, which gets back to the question of, you know, when do you disseminate that knowledge? You really want to be able to feel confident enough about it or that you've done all the work you can and, and considered all the possibilities. So I think that that capacity to refute and that that's written into it is a crucial part of it. Part of it is using the best tools available for seeing that we have now. So when there is data available, I mean, I, I'm a b big believer in multiple methods. I, you know, if you have, and multiple collaborators, if you have a problem, the best way to approach it is to bring in all the tools and all the people who can help you figure it out to argue among each other until you actually make an advance. That's a traditional science tool. You know, we're just beginning to move to that kind of model in social science, and I advocate that. We have another question from the audience. Uh, here we go. Hey, David. Hey, so my question is, 
To what extent are you looking around for clues outside of, of academia? In the sense that, you know, you look at the music industry and their music was generated one way for a long time and then Napster and iTunes, mm -hmm. and this whole, the networked age changed things there and journalism, you can look That's around. That's a social science problem. Right, yeah, I mean, you could see it all around, see these different kind of clues and trends. And, and in all of those cases, the way that the kind of institution got blown up was from an outsider. So to what extent are you bringing in outsiders uh, to, this, to this process, if you are at all? Do you we, are, we are at all. Um, <laughs> so again, the way our collaborative groups are organized is some of them are just academics, but most of them are not. They're involving people who have really come at this problem a totally different way. Um, they may be, be from government. They may be from industry. They may be from singularity. Paul Sappho is part of the future of work and workers group, who brings a whole different perspective and set of questions than an academic would bring. But it's been crucial to our process that those questions are coming from all over the place, that we're open, and this is part of the scientific method, too, that you're open to what's really going on, not just to the little thing that you're looking at. You need both the telescope and the microscope, right? You can't just be looking at your own little piece of cell or earth. You have to understand how that cell or earth fits into a larger whole. So Betzik, who I mentioned, who developed these incredible new microscopes, works very closely with biologists because he can't figure out what the microscope can really do and what it's distorting unless somebody who knows what they think they should be seeing can inform him. So we can't do it by ourselves. And we have to get that information and that disruption from every source that we can. That is part of the really good social science method, to be open to all of that possibility and then to discipline it to the extent we can until it's disrupted again. Uh, and by the way, I think that, if I'm not wrong, um, How Music Got Free was written at, the, about the MP3 coming right. out, was, was written at CASBIS, <laughs> as a lot of these um, things were. Um, say say it's a, a moment about uh, your own work in political science um, going to this. We've got your book here, I believe your collaborator is also mm -hmm. is a CASBIS fellow this year. And is, is there he here. is, okay. John. Okay. Hi, John. <laughs> Who was a um, CASPIS fellow this year? So, uh, can can you say uh, uh, something about your work, and maybe also about, you know, how how that maybe led to? I mean, does, does, is is the way that you were looking at political science have anything to do with your ending up as as uh, director of of CASPIS? I or? hope I haven't ended up, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, so the way station <laughs> along the way. Yes. I don't know what's next. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, anyway, <laughs> so my own work, well, and in some ways it illustrates what I mean by the, the, the method in social science. So I am deeply interested, which may not surprise you from my emphasis on moral economy, on the relationships between citizens and government or subjects and their states, depending on the historical period and the interactions between them and how they influence each other and why you see compliance sometimes and non-compliance and rebellion at other times. And I've looked at and, and how you change beliefs, that question about uh, false news, how you create environments in which people come to believe that they can act in ways they didn't know they could act in, that the world is different than they thought it was, or how they come to believe that it's a really narrow world or that they should only act on narrow economistic interests. So those are the kinds of questions that compel me. But to answer those questions required me to look at very specific and, if you will, arcane things, not so arcane, taxes, conscription, and military service, as way, and, and ultimately at the book that uh, John and I wrote is looking at labor unions as a way, because labor unions are mini governments, right? In the interest of others, <laughs> this book. Um, anyway, so, and I can tell you where this comes yeah, from because it's, I will do that in a second. But we look at those things in, as a way to understand the mechanisms and dynamics. It's a way to reveal the cellular structure, if you will, and the, the mechanics of how cooperation happens, how um, resentment, distrust, 
non-cooperation takes place. But to do that, you've got to really understand it, at, at, if you will, at a very detailed level and then sort of write it out and figure out where it can apply in other kinds of context, in larger kinds of systems. And so in the interest of others, um, the star of the book is, in many ways, Harry Bridges, who was a legendary uh, longshore worker and union organizer based in San Francisco, originally Australian. You can tell I have an Australia thing going here. Um, and this is a mural that was done that's in the Rincon Center. This is a version of that mural of the big strike that he ran in 1934 and that helped the workers uh, be transformed from what were called um, the, the sort of, they, they were the rats of the wharf and they became the lords of the dock, right? Um, so what he was able to do in that union and some other unions were able to do is not something most unions did, but is still an interesting way to figure out if this is possible was through a variety of institutional arrangements, governance arrangements, educational arrangements, to evoke from membership a commitment to act on behalf in the interest of others who they would never see, with whom they had no in personal reciprocal relationship. And how did we do that? How were we able to, to figure that out and to demonstrate it? We looked at archives. We did interviews with people who were still alive, though we had all this um, interview material from the long past. We looked at the conventions um, and the kinds of arguments and debates at the educational institutions, and not just in these unions that did this, but also in unions that didn't, in order to, so the comparison is another critical part, always having a comparison set, either implied or explicit, um, in order to understand the conditions under which these kinds of changes in belief would take place and when they wouldn't, and under what conditions you might evoke from people this commitment to act in the interest of others. Um, I want to get one more uh, from, from the room. I actually want to quickly, though, paraphrase, and then we'll, and then everyone's going to hang I'm out gonna and, and in swarm my hand, around <laughs> you. <laughs> or uh, two. Because we, we only have a little bit more time, but we, we want you to stay, and our, our speaker, as, as always, uh, sticks around to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation. And, and it's important, don't line up. She's going to be, you're going to be signing books. I think John uh, will, will come over and sign books for, for folks who got books tonight. Um, but, it's not uh, an easy book to read. I yeah. told a better story than it's a read. I just have to warn you before you spend all your money. <laughs> so. John had to get tenure. We had to meet certain... <laughs> So there's some more questions to ask about academia <laughs> there, I think. But um, to paraphrase a question that came in from the, the our live stream folks, wh what do you do about when not just false news, but that false knowledge, if you will, starts to build up a body and starts to have uh, a, you know, its own, in, in some ways mimicking uh, what what happens with uh, with real science. And I think about, I, I once upon had, time had done some work in like tobacco control issues and so forth and the, uh, the, the, the fake grassroots organizations and the fake science that was funded by corporations sometimes right. with an interest. Um, is there anything in academia or is there, because clearly the news doesn't do a good job of, um, well, we can't count on the news. There's some good journalism out there still certainly. And by the way, Dan Gilmore is speaking for us in October, so to the question about fake news. Um, he's a veteran journalist and a great journalist, and he's going to be talking yes. about um, the future of journalism and, and some of the problems today. So look out for that one as well. But but, but what are what your thoughts about that? Is is yeah is is there is is there anything in academia or anything you know what helps us in society with combating an an organized mimicry of what looks like good science, if you will? Well, I think the problem is is even worse than you're describing it because if you know. In my talk, I mentioned a report that was circulated by um, the social science guy on NPR. I've read things in the New York Times science section or, you know, so it's not just Fox News or the, the groups, the grassroots groups. It's a deeper misunderstanding of when something, it's back to the question of when something should be disseminated and when it shouldn't be. And the incentives in the universities still encourage the publication even when there shouldn't be publication. Um, you know, that's not, it's not a fully, 
create, it's not a fully justified finding. And people will write, we were in a conversation today about a Nobel economist who was a former CASBIS fellow, um, James Heckman, who's a brilliant guy. But he's written on the same experiment, as somebody said, more, more times than there were even multiples more times than there were subjects in the experiment. You know, so at some point, you're <laughs> the incentives are screwy. So material is getting out there that then gets reported as truth, which is still, first of all, there is no truth in that exact sense. And second of all, it's, it, it's being picked up faster than it can be really refuted appropriately. So some of that is the responsibility of academics and transforming our own incentives so that we're not encouraging that kind of behavior. And some of it, I think, is other kinds of things that we as academics can do, which we're not always good at. Some are, some aren't, which is really um, figuring out ways to disseminate information in a better way. So it's both more credible and it's also clearer about just what the state of that knowledge is. That it, you know, sometimes it's a process. It's not that it's, it's absolutely firm. Now there are things where we know for sure that they're like the tobacco has terrible effects on people and where there was a big campaign to, of disinformation. Climate change is another one. Those are different kinds of problems because I don't think academics can do a lot about refuting big money that's being poured into disinformation, except to keep yelling and saying, wait a minute, that's not the story. And, and hopefully not getting roped in as an accomplice in that's that right. big money, which that's right. is a thing. Um, do we have one more question over here? Great, last question, thanks. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk, it's wonderful. I was wondering why you didn't mention the printing press in your organizational knowledge. And I know it's a distribution channel, but such a powerful one that it impacted the way we organize things. I didn't mention a lot of things. <laughs> um, I was really trying to think about not just the tools, the things that happened, but really the um, organizations, the institutions, rather than the technologies. So I could have gone on and on about telescopes and microscopes. Uh, you know, there are lots of technologies, and the printing press is one of the most important that have really transformed access to information and distribution of information. The contemporary one is the data transformation, you know, which is really changing what we have available um, to process um, for science. So there are multiple ones of that I didn't mention because I was focused on something else. Another talk. And, and I want to mention, um, as, as we're ending on that, the, the uh, a couple pointers, I mean, a bunch of pointers to former CASPA speakers are, are coming to mind, even in the printing press question with Jennifer uh, Peterson's yeah, talk last, uh, this, this past year. Um, one is uh, just a pointer if, if you, I don't know if some of you have seen uh, George Dyson's talk about the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, which was referenced earlier. It's a really interesting talk, and I think an interesting uh, comparison here. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll post that to our social channels as well as the, um, Remind me of the Nobel uh, uh, Prize Betzik. winner, the Besic uh, uh, talk, which is actually already up on the the event page. We'll, we'll put that out there. Um, so uh, I th I think there's nothing left to, but to to say thank you and thank you for being a great audience. Thank and you. Please stick around. Bring more questions up here. I've got about a hundred. If they don't, so <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael.